Very good. All right, let's turn our Bibles to want to look at uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Solomon is called the preacher in Ecclesiastes. And tonight we're going to look at something that we often feel it happens to us. We try to do something and there's unattended consequences for something that seems so minor but it turned out to be a really big deal. And I believe as we look at the scriptures this evening, this text bears discussing that subject. Let's stand together, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. <coughs> Boy, I haven't coughed ever, and then I start coughing when I get up here. But let's look what it says in verse number 1. Verse number 1 of Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Dead flies and the ointment of the apothecary sends forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him. And he saith to every one, he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place, for yielding pacifieth great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. And the rich sit in low place, in a, a low place. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. And whoso breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And he that cleaveth, excuse me, cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. If thine iron be blunt, and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. I just look at all verse number one, go all the way up to the beginning. It says, "Dead flies in the appoint in the ointment of apothecary send to send forth a stinking savor." I want to preach a message I've simply titled this evening, Unattended Consequences. Unattended Consequences. Let's pray together, can we? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity that you give us to look into your word. And tonight, in many ways, this message is a warning to all of us. It's a warning that the little things, that little sins, Little areas of our life can have dramatic, dramatic consequences. Lord, I pray you would fill me with the Spirit. Encourage that one that's struggling tonight. Convict the sinner that's struggling with an area of their life. And save that soul that's nearest hell. Guide and direct as only you can. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless you. you may be seated. This section can be described in some words. And maybe you could describe it reading this, and especially after you hear the message, at least what I'm going to emphasize this evening. It could be summed up by saying, I didn't know it would be this bad doing something so minor. How did I get here? I wish I had known. I wish somebody had warned me. It's been said by some, and this is not original with, uh, there's several people that claim to be the originator of this, so I didn't give anybody the credit for it. But you've heard the statement, sin will take you farther than you need to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. 
And that's really kind of the summation of the downward spiral that we see Solomon lamenting here. And in many ways, we can look through the Bible. We think of Bathsheba in 1 Samuel, where David goes up onto the, excuse me, 2 Samuel, where David goes up onto the roof just for a peek and led to literally the downfall of David. We can see that things happen. I think of a man that attended here years ago and he was doing pretty well and he was working a second job and he, he just took a little cash out of the cash register. It was just a, mean, a minuscule amount. And everybody look here, do not miss this. To this day, he can't get clearance on almost any job he wants to work because of that one criminal act he did. Even though it's been expunged from his record, He's not allowed to have almost any federal job. Just a little sin cost a whole lot. We can think of that in all kind of areas. We think of a plane that was flying in outside of Spain in Madrid and was coming up the mountains and just for a moment the pilot turned off the navigation system because he said, I've flown this so many times. The navigation system was called Ringo, and he says, Ringo, shut up. And he flew the plane to the side of the mountain and killed everybody on board. Just a little thing. Just ignoring the instruments. Today, there will, for some, there is a moment. Some of you may be watching. No one's going to snap a picture of it. It's going to come quickly by. It probably won't make it into your journal if you journal devotions. It won't linger in your thoughts. You may not even lose sleep over it. But for some, it will come. It may slip by unnoticed, but its effects won't slip. They'll stay, they'll foster, they'll grow sometimes to epidemic proportions. This moment, something will creep into your heart and it'll pull your focus from wrong, from right to wrong. There will be a hint of distortion, the smallest amount. Maybe seem insignificant, but it'll grow beyond what you can ever imagine. It could be an affair and an outside of marriage brewing. A cute little lie at the water cooler. A lie that will disqualify you from a job. A social media post that will come back to haunt you and cause you to lose your job. And let me just park it right there just for a moment. I've seen that happen. And I kind of, I've warned the teens, I'm warning you, and I'm warning everybody out here that when you post anything on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook, it's there for the rest of the time that you breathe air. And you will have to give an account for that forever. And there is no constitutional right to say, oh, that was when I was a kid, I really don't mean it. You better be careful what you say, how you say it. And I'm not saying censoring anything. I'm not for the shutdown or the cancel culture, but I do know people that have lost their jobs because they said something very unchristian and inappropriate. Then you can go to your HR people and they will laugh at you and kick you out the door. There is no second chance. Maybe your union can help you for a while, but it won't serve. You need to be careful. Just a little thing. I have a particular cousin of mine years ago that had said something wrong on a telephone conversation where he didn't think somebody else at his office was listening and he got fired at a very high post. He was a vice president of a corporation for one little thing. So what Solomon is saying here, it just takes a little bit of something that messes up the perfume to stink up the whole place. A social media poise, attendance at a party resulted in the death of somebody I know. Just showing up should not have been there. We think of Moses when he 
wanted to speak. He was instructed to speak to the rock so the water would not come out to quench the thirst of the people. And even though, even though his anger towards the people may have been excused, he hit the rock instead of speaking to it, and this caused him never to go in to the promised land. It says in Numbers chapter 20, verse number 10, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand in anger, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. He just a little thing. Moses. Unfortunately, in our culture, what people remember is things like that. I love sports. I mean, I love Rich Tozier here. I mean, we were in hog heaven. We were like, we had the greatest time talking about football, and we were going through. My wife was born here to death. He was over Sunday afternoon, and we came back, and we went skiing on Monday, and we're talking about things. And one of the things we talked about are great sports figures that had great careers but they're only known for the last thing they did when they messed up. Jackie Smith dropping the ball in the end zone against the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Super Bowl in 1978. He played for the Dallas Cowboys. He dropped the football in the end zone, and Pittsburgh won the Super Bowl, and the only thing Jackie Smith is ever known for, one of the greatest tight ends ever to play the football, the only thing he's ever known for is dropping the ball in the Super Bowl. Bill Buckner, the ball between his legs, in the 1986 World Series, went right between his legs. Great, great first baseman, great baseball player. The Bill Buckner ball sold at Christie's London House auction for really tens of thousands of dollars. The ball that went between his legs, that's the only thing he's known for. I want to tell you, life is cruel, Satan will destroy, and you need to be careful because sometimes it's the little things that get in the way, and that's all you'll be remembered by. Sobering thought, isn't it? We don't have to live in fear, though. We don't have to live there. A couple things quickly is that consequences, not keeping your promises, promises has unintended consequences. I just got a list of things before we start walking through the text. I think this can have long-lasting consequences. You don't think about it, especially with your children. You say you'll do something, you promise to show up, and you don't do it. You find ways to avoid doing what you promised to do. That has unattended consequences. Lying has unattended consequences. All shapes, sizes, all kinds, all the time. You be careful. Let your yea be yea, your nay be nay. If you always tell the truth, Mark Twain comment, you'll never have to remember what you said. Cruel speech about those whom we differ has unattended consequences. And by the way, have we not seen that in this political season. I've heard people call Democrats some of the cruelest, most ridiculous names, and their excuse for saying it is the following. Well, listen to what they say about us. Like Jesus taught that, retaliate when you treat it unfairly? Seriously? Do not look at me and try to justify such nonsense. I may agree with what you say, but honestly, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. No grace for ordinary failure has unintended consequences. The Bible says we're to restore a brother and sister like we would want to be treated. Why is the Christian will, will enforce the smallest rule to the nth degree but with no thought of mercy? So there's so much more there. But let's walk through the text here. Let's walk through the text. Those are just some of my thoughts as we lead into this. Unattended consequences of sin. Number one, and I've kind of covered this a little bit, causes great damage to all. Look what he says in the first three verses. He says there, as again, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary 
that would be a municipal, municipal a healing type of perfume to send forth a stinking savor. So does a little folly. Now remember this, little folly. When the Hebrew talks about it, it, what we're looking at something incredibly small. A little folly, now don't miss this, him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. It takes just a little to mess up the whole thing. Think about that. A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Yes, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth. And guess what? Everybody sees it. He saith to everyone that he is a fool. In other words, people can see you're going that way. It's kind of like progressive here. So among the Jews, if we go back to verse number one, among the Jews, oil rendered a fragrant, rendered fragrant by being mixed with precious drugs and was used for many medical purposes. Whether the priests and the kings were anointed when they entered upon their offices, that's another application. Guests at the tables of the rich were treated to it as a luxury and was used medically for outward application to the bodies of the sick and, of course, and corpses were <clears throat> it was used as well. Very great care was needed in the preparation of the material for its special purposes. Elaborately, it was put together, but it was easily spoiled and rendered worthless. And when Solomon wrote this, they knew exactly what he was talking about. It was accordingly necessary not only to take great pains to making it, but also preserving it from contamination. A dead fly would corrupt the ointment and turn it into a pestilent odor. And so what he's saying, it just took one dead fly to ruin the whole thing. And sometimes we need to be careful about the little things. Or as one preacher said, the little foxes they get in and eat the entire chicken house. Verse number two, we see we have a wise man's heart is at his right hand, the fool's heart is at his left hand. One is in the right place, the other is in the wrong place. And sometimes we start listening to the wrong heart, if you want to give me the liberty of saying that. Minor decisions that have disastrous results. The right one we're familiar with, but guess what? The left one is the one listened to. It's a sad thing that that happened. Small decisions, I think, of people that have made the little decisions that have had disastrous consequences. One of the things I've talked to the teenagers about, and I talk every year I speak with the teens, three or four times a year, is be careful that you don't make decisions in your teenage years that will last for the rest of your life. And it happens. And be careful about making adult decisions when you're not prepared to act like an adult as well. Number two, unattended consequence of a sin will cause the reversed order of things. In other ways, it's it's all backwards. It's all backwards. Now, if you read a casual reading of this, it looks, it's hard to, I, I guess, come across and see what Solomon is saying. But what he's saying is the world's turned upside down. Now, how many believe we have leaders that are in the wrong places? We'd all agree with that, right? And sometimes everything's turned upside down. Right is wrong, wrong is right. I don't want to get into uh, some of the things I heard coming out of Washington today, but God's in charge, and we just need to pray that God will... I'm not, I'm not uh, hoping that, that, that we're going to have a Christian nation because of this, but I do know that uh, for whatever reason, that's where we are. And sometimes we have... Same things seem to be backwards, but maybe the backwardsness of this is the little things that led up to it. By the way, the last four years, we haven't seen great revival with the other people in office, have we? 
Maybe God wants us to bring us to the point of repentance. Nobody wants to hear that, though. I don't want to hear it. There's a reversed order of things. Now, look what he says. The first one says you need to stand. Don't give, don't, don't give in. It says that the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee. Leave not thy place, for yielding pacify of great offenses. Then it looks like there's a progression there that that may didn't happen. And it says in verse number 5, there is an evil which I've seen under the sun. And such an error, key word to understand this, an error which proceeded from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in a low place. In other words, those that should be in place are not there. The wrong people are there. Now, I'm not saying poor people shouldn't lead, and it doesn't mean uh, servants shouldn't be on horses, which he says, but the application of what Solomon is writing is the reverse order of the way it should be. Don't look at it from a 21st century cultural bias when you read this. Put yourself on what Solomon is saying. And he says in verse 7, I've seen servants upon horses. That's not what it's supposed to be like. And princes walking as servants. He said everything is upside down. Not that that's right or wrong if you get out of focus here. So what do we see here? Solomon is not saying there's a proper class system and the class the rich overrule the poor. That's not what he's saying, and that's not, don't even go there. What he is saying is a result of disobeying verse number four. Everything has been turned upside down. The wrong people are in charge. He warns not to overreact. The wrong people are there. How about this? Because of my sin, the wrong people are making decisions for me. Capable men sit on the sidelines while uninformed and capable are in charge. One application could be you've lost control over decision making of raising your children because of something you've done in your marriage. The unintended consequences of an affair that you had, you have lost the opportunity to make decisions. And now somebody else who should not be there is making the decision now. And boy, have I heard this over the years. And it's heartbreaking to deal with that. Solomon has seen fools occupying high positions, what he's saying. He's seen the wrong people in charge. Unattended consequences, the order is reversed. Those that should be in charge are relegated to watching. Now that's real hard, isn't it? Very hard. And we need prayer. But God's a God of mercy and a God of love. James Dobson had a story years ago, and it kind of started out this way, and it wasn't anybody's particular fault. There was a a man and a woman, they were going through some difficulties in their marriage, and uh, if I remember the story correctly, and I'm going to try to get it as right as I can, I know I've used this illustration before, and in the marriage, um, they wind up getting a divorce, and uh, unfortunately, and the woman won the rights to her child, the only child they had, and the woman wound up getting, back then they didn't have gay marriage, but she wound up being with another woman, a lesbian relationship, and he applied for uh, custody, and uh, He was a part of a a pretty big evangelical church in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, that church had, it was a great church, but I tell you, it's it's not doctrinally solid as we are. And he lost the custody hearing. She got custody to this woman and 
her partner. And then it got worse. The woman actually passed away, the wife, the natural. And um, he said, surely I'll get my child back. And the court system, no, the other person got it. So got the baby. And he prayed and prayed and prayed. And he says, there's somebody making decisions about my child. And nothing that was a sin, not necessarily applying to here, does a sin cause this to happen. But that woman, according to James Dobson in the story, the lesbian woman who had the child wound up uh, being being friended by a Christian. She wound up getting saved, the lesbian woman. And because of that decision to be saved, she gave the child back to the father. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't all look very good when we're going through it. But God has a plan. And I want to tell you, the most dangerous thing we can see in applying here is having the wrong people making decisions for us as a result of something little we did that put us in that position. And I can speak to that over and over and over again. So number two, let me just walk back here. Number two is reversed order of things. Sometimes it just doesn't seem to be working out. And God help all of us people that are sweating. I got a letter from somebody in a prison down in Florida that used to be in this church years and years and years ago. And he's never probably ever going to get out. He sat right here with the youth group for a while and did something that will never, he may never be released. How do you encourage somebody like that? You say, God, I love you. God's good. He's, he know he made a mistake. And it was a decision to be around the wrong people at the wrong time and doing the wrong thing. And the crime was so hideous. It wasn't murder. But in this particular environment, he'll probably never get out of prison. So we need to be careful. And our children need to hear this. Our adults need to hear this. Number three, as I get to it, misdirection and injury. Here's something that happens. Sometimes <laughs> unattended consequences of sin mean that you're, there's a misdirection and injury in something you're very familiar with. Look what he says here. Verse number eight. He that diggeth the pit shall fall into it. By the way, when you dig the pit, you weren't planning on getting in it yourself, were you? Whoso breaketh the hedge, this is a, a opportunity. We're looking at maybe some type of a gardener, somebody who's used to that type of thing. Uh, he's going to get by a serpent. He should know better than that. Right? How about this one? Whoso removes the stone shall be hurt by them. They ought to know that. He ought to know better than that. He that cleaveth wood, that means somebody chops wood, is going to be endangered by it. The very thing you know a lot about is going to be your undoing. Think about that. The very thing. Be careful. And then verse number 10, if the iron be blunt, and you do so not wet the edge, in other words, if you're trying to split wood, and you've got to sharpen the edge of it, then you must put more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. It was not expected. How about this? I do this all the time. How did this happen? It's like a financial manager going bankrupt. I was with the company one time, and we were doing a project in Philadelphia. And um, the very guy that was in charge of the financial manager of this other company, um, he was supposed to be running payroll on Friday. And most of us here, when payroll comes around, we kind of want to get paid on Friday, right? It's a, a minimum thing. And we found out that back then they had actually checks. I know that seems strange to some of you watching, but used to when you worked a job, believe this or not, you might not believe this, but I know this is hard to understand. At the end of the day, you got an envelope with your name on it, and it had the company's name and had a check. And then you had to go to the bank and you find a bank, you gave it to them, and they could either deposit you or they could give you cash. Novel idea, but I know most people have never heard of it, but there's some of us older ones that remember those days. So anyway, I went to get my check, and they said we can't give them because they'll all bounce. And the very guy that was in charge of the money, the very guy that was splitting wood and should have known better, or the guy that was digging a pit, should have known not to fall in it, 
The very guy that was doing all that wasn't watching the store very good. And he had too much money in the stock market. The market crashed that day, and the checks could not bounce. He should have known better. That's what you study. That's who you are. And honestly, knowing the fellow, it wasn't something he did intentionally. It was just an omission that caused him to lose his job. And can I say this, ladies and gentlemen, when I saw the unintended consequences sometimes hurt in areas that you're very, very, should not happen, you're very familiar with. Could be your finances, could be your health. Injuries are going to happen. Your family will fall into a pit that you dug for another purpose, one writer said. The unintended consequences of your unfaithfulness to church as you raise your children will lead your children to take what you did in moderation, they'll do in excess. The serpent will bite you. The log you split will tear, sever your hand. The very thing you know how to do will be the very thing that undoes you, that is your undoing. So not a real encouraging text tonight, but that's where we landed this plane. But what it does help all of us is to really focus on our walk with God, focus on our who we are, and remember it's the little foxes that get us, that tears down the wall. It's the little foxes that cause such damage. And sometimes we just need to be men and women of prayer. I shared with um, Brother Tozier, we were talking, we had to drive up skiing about two hours there, two hours back, really two and a half hours there because of snow. And we were going over praying, and, and he was showing me his little prayer booklet, how he has different people, and I was saying how we pray, and my acronym on how I read the Bible and pray, and how um, my wife and I pray together. We actually pray sometimes, we run together, we pray different people in the church. We I don't know if I said this on Wednesday or not the other day, but my wife and I will pray. And the other day we ran and we, we went through the entire church directory in our head. And we missed a lot of names. And we prayed for somebody. The really thing, if you like to run, by the time we got done praying for everybody, it was almost over. It felt like we were even running. And, uh, but, you know, different ways to pray, different ways to pray for people. I want to ask you, maybe the little thing that's getting into your life is your lack of prayer. Maybe it's your lack of faithfulness. And it seems kind of little now, right? But it'd be really big later. So I got on the screen. I can't, I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not, I'm not trying to um, say anything other than encourage you, but what small thing in your life is God convicting you of tonight that will have unintended consequences? By the way, God doesn't want it to happen. That happen. But it does happen. I think of the guy that took some money out of the register years ago. It was in 2001 or 2002. And it hounded him for the rest of his life getting federal work and security clearances because he was arrested for it. Qualified man. But to this day, I mean, as far as I know, he wasn't able, able to get security clearance to do what he really is trained to do. It's a shame, isn't it? I wonder when he took that money he said, I'm going to throw my entire life away for the next 40 years for 30 bucks in cash. Seriously? So let's, let's all pray together. This is for you. I want to pray with you, pray with those here, and then we'll go through our prayer request. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for conviction. And Lord, maybe there's somebody watching tonight. That there is some inappropriateness going on between you and a member of the opposite sex. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that's watching that the unintended consequences, you have let your family down by constantly promising to do something and never doing it. And maybe the end result will be your children check out. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that, I, something I haven't mentioned, but there's something that you don't want the world turned upside down. You want to be in charge of what God's given you. You don't want somebody else making decisions for you because of your sin. Whatever it may be, can we just 
spent a few moments as an invitation of crying out to God, and there's nothing that's been brought to your attention, then praise God for it and ask God to keep you on the straight and narrow. Whatever it may be, let's pray together.